Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Calvary. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tracy Beaker. I'm the youth director. And Pastor Phil is um, still on his sabbatical right now. And Pastor Steve Dahl is at the Synod Assembly Gathering in Moorhead, and, um, which I was just actually informed by John Kruger that Bishop Woolrobbie was re-elected by over 75% the, of the vote on the first ballot. So a, a good overwhelming vote for Larry. And um, just a few announcements. A peace Circle this Wednesday will be held at Calvary instead of Linda Legrid's house um, because she was called to jury duty. And um, we, we um, give sympathies to the family of Tim Berkland, whose mother, Mary Ann, passed away this past week after being diagnosed with cancer. And we, we um, keep them in our prayers also. I do want to draw your attention to something in your bulletin this morning, this insert. It's the Twigs Together Winning in God's Service, which is an, a community organization that is comprised of many, many Calvary members, but also members from our community. And this is an organization that um, tries to meet needs for families that are struggling in our community. And we're kind of a last resort organization. So the families or people that are asking for help, it's, it's kind of like they've, they've gone through and jumped through every hoop that they can to get help from the county or Mahubi or, or other avenues. And we do strive very hard to use those funds very well and keep them local in our town. And if, as you can see on the back, what we started our year with, $11,500, and we had a little, about $2,000 come in an offering, and we've spent 13000 just since January. So our funds are down to $476 and it's early June. It was a long winter and we did, we did list some of the needs that you can read of what we've done with that money. We, we do try to be very good stewards of that money and there's kind of a process that people have to go through. And in most cases there are children involved also and it's, it's usually a family that's kind of one of the, one of the things that we try to follow is that, it, it's a, that there's a family involved. It's not usually a single person. But it, there are some extenuating circumstances sometimes, even with single people, that we do help out. So we, we do try very hard to investigate and make sure that we're not just, just giving them money that's, that's going to get them deeper into the hole, that it's something that's really going to truly help them in their, in their future and get them connected with people who can help them, help them budget or, or whatever their needs are. But we have a lot of um, working poor in our area and, and when even just you are making ends meet, just something like a car, a car repair or a medical bill or something like that can just throw your world into chaos. And we have a lot of families like that around here that need our help. So we ask you to prayerfully consider giving to the twigs, giving just a general amount for anything that they, that they deem necessary at the time, or taking a look at the tree out in the fellowship hall for a specific need that you are able to donate all or part of. If you look at a need and it's for rent for $500 and you think, wow, I can't do that, you can still donate 25 or 50 towards that that item as well. So just know that, that it doesn't have to be completely filled. Okay, let's start with our brief order of confession. Please rise if you are able. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to help the Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done 
and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
and we join in the prayer of the day. Compassionate God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now we continue with the readings. You may be seated. The readings today are for the third week of Pentecost. Having offered hospitality to Elijah, a widow in Zarephath loses her son to an illness. Through prayer, Elijah restores the boy to life, and a joyful mother acknowledges that Elijah is indeed a man of God. The first reading is from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24, a reading from 1 Kings. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. His illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up into the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. The life of the child came into him again and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord is in your, in your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord. The apostle and church planter Paul tells the story of his ministry given to him by Jesus Christ. In the midst of grave tension in his work in Galatia, he assures his congregation that his work is centered in the pure gospel of Jesus Christ, unlike the other teachers among them. The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 1, verses 11 through 24. A reading from Galatians. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard, no doubt, of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me. But I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you, before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, The one who formerly was persecuting is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorify God because of me. 
The word of the Lord. Gospel reading from today is from Luke 7, verses 11 through 24, the reading of the Gospel. Glory to you, Lord. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow, and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched her and touched the bier, and the bear stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. The, this word about him spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirit, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, um... The last time I was asked to do the message, this time last year, it was Trinity Sunday, but I didn't know that until after I'd already agreed to do it, if you remember, that um, I found out that was the one Sunday a year when most pastors, when most uh, supply pastors are needed, because, I don't know, pastors must not like to preach about the Trinity. And um, so I kind of gave the message in a way that I would give it to my confirmation students, because that's what I know, that's... That's what, I'm, what I feel called and what I'm passionate about. And um, uh, if you remember, I used my children's message and compared the Trinity to a s'more. Remember the graham cracker and the marshmallow and the chocolate? And I was basically accused of being a heretic. So, um, so I asked specifically, is it Trinity Sunday? No, okay, then I'll, then I'll do it if it's not Trinity Sunday. But... But one thing I, I know that I'm not a great, I would never be a good pastor because I can't do a sermon too far in advance. Rand knows this because he asked me for the slides ahead of time and, and I get four or five kind of different topics in my head, but it's hard for me to kind of focus on one and I always kind of wait for the Holy Spirit to move me in one direction. But my problem is I don't really spend that much time actually listening for the Holy Spirit. I just think it's magically going to happen, and I spend more time doing other things than I do listening to the Spirit lead me in one direction. So I was literally texting some youth last night, okay, what should I talk about? I can't focus. The gospel lesson isn't really speaking to me. What, what do you guys think? What do you guys want to hear? Because they, they have some pretty deep questions and some deep thoughts that the kids do sometimes. So I got some kind of smart alecky answers like, why don't you talk about God? Or why don't you talk about Jesus? And somebody said I should do one on procrastination. <laughs> and which, uh, yeah. And I got a couple really deep ones too. And somebody just said the Bible and so did even my daughter. Oh, you should talk about the Bible. 
And, and one of the youth, their question was, how do we know the Bible is true? How do we know what it says and who wrote it and some of this stuff that the, it says happened really happened? So I decided that that's, that was what I was going to answer because a lot of my confirmation students ask this same question. And I don't even believe that they're the only ones who have this question. I believe as adults even, we kind of struggle with, with how, how do we know that those things really happened. So, um, so the, oh, here was another one too, Noah's Ark, because if this rain keeps up, we're going to need one. <laughs> and so, so I decided, you know, two species on a boat. I know even I struggled sometimes with that, and so maybe once a heretic, always a heretic. I, I could be walking a fine line by what I'm, I'm going to, to talk to you about, but don't co go running to Pastor Steve tomorrow and complain. At least wait till Pastor Phil gets back, because he'll be all refreshed from his vacation and everything, so to talk about what that youth director said. So I'm just going to kind of say that I don't really believe that, that there is inerrancy in the Bible. I mean, I, I believe that the Bible is the God-breathed word, that it is inspired by God, but I don't believe that it is inerrant. I still have faith in the Bible, and I believe that to have faith, you need a certain element of doubt, because I think faith is believing in something even with the absence of maybe evidence to support that belief. Um, uh, Anne Lamott, I don't know if any of you have ever written or read any books by Anne Lamott, but she wrote a book where she says, the opposite of faith is not doubt, it is certainty. So being certain about something is the opposite of faith, not doubting. And now some people, I've had this discussion with some people about that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. That is it. And the argument they have is, if there is room for error in the Bible, then how can we believe that any of it is true? How can you trust any of it? So my answer is faith. And how do I know this? Because I have, I had a mother. She passed away. But I'm going to use my mother here. So how many of you, your mother taught you, look both ways before you cross the street? None of you? Okay, yeah. Well, my mom, you know, if you step out and you don't look, you might get clipped by a car, and you might get hurt, or worse, even killed. I've taught this to my own daughter, not very well, if any of you have ever seen her run out in the parking lot. I'm, it's a miracle she still made it to age six. But she, now my mom taught me this, and my mom wasn't perfect, and she would be the first one to have admitted that. She had a lifetime ex of experience, but she was not inerrant. But yet I could still trust that stepping out in front of a moving automobile would have a less than desirable consequence for my well-being. <laughs> and why? Because inerrancy isn't really necessary for conveying the truth or knowledge or even my trust. I know that something can't be completely wrong and still be true, but a mistake doesn't make someone or something invalid. And this is why this example of my mother is kind of important because we grow up and we kind of all go through that stage where we realize that our mother or our father, that our parents, our guardians, whoever took care of us, aren't perfect. No matter how much I wanted her to be perfect, I had to accept the fact eventually that my mother made mistakes and there were things that she was wrong about. But that reality didn't negate all the true things that my mother taught me, like how walking in front of traffic is a terrible idea. So when I became an adult, my husband would argue that I haven't become one yet, but when I grew up, I went from a place of certainty, where I believed my mother was perfect, to more of a place of faith, where I recognized that she did indeed have flaws. And nothing about my mother changed during this time, she still loved me and I loved her just as much as ever. And I might have asked more questions of her as I got older than I did when I was four or five, but a lifetime of her love and guidance allowed me to continue to put my faith in her that she wanted what was best for me, that she loved me, and when she spoke, she believed what she spoke to be the truth. 
And even if I found mistakes in what she said or did, it didn't mean she became some untrustworthy liar. So in other words, my mom is a lot like the Bible. She was perfect. She wasn't perfect. But I can still trust that what she said is true. I think it's okay. I believed the story of Noah's Ark when I was young, that it was filled with two of every species. And I think it's okay. But I think it is okay to, as you grow, that you might question the possibility of Noah's Ark really happening. Now again, I'm not saying I'm certain that it didn't happen because it was God after all. But, but I know sometimes people question even was the world really created in six days? And I am not saying I'm certain it wasn't. I'm just saying that, I, that even I, at my age, question the po physical and scientific possibility of that really happening. Because I think that the truth of Noah's Ark, that story, isn't found necessarily in the zoological arrangements of it, but in the story of a God who watches over us and cares for his creation even in the midst of a storm. So even in this gospel explanation, this gospel story today, there's scientific explanations. I don't have any of you ever seen these stories where they try to scientifically explain something that happened in the Bible, like Jesus bringing this boy back to life, or when Elijah brought the, brought the man back to life, laid on him three times. And so these scientists try to explain how this really happened, what really maybe happened here, or try to scientifically or meteorologically explain the parting of the Red Sea. And I think it's kind of funny, because you can't even be certain about science, right? I mean, we had scientists that at one time all thought the earth was flat and that the earth that the sun revolved around the earth and that at one point all the smartest people thought that the atom was the smallest thing and to quote my favorite friends character if any of you were ever friends fans Phoebe Buffay said until they split it open and this whole mess of crap came out so I think that these sort of truths and the truth that the Bible is trying to get across aren't necessarily contingent on the perfection of the author or even on the authors getting the facts right, but these truths require a truthful message. And I did say authors because the simple reality is the Bible was written by humans, by people. If you don't believe me, just pick it up and read it, because many of the books of the Bible even explicitly state their human authorship. For example, our reading today, every one of Paul's letters. Now, this doesn't mean that the Bible is not God-breathed, that it's not useful for teaching. It very much is. But God-breathed scripture and inerrant scripture are two different things. We know this, the Bible even tells us this. There's another kind of big moment about being God-breathed in Scripture. We find it right in the beginning, in Genesis 2, verse 7, God took the dust of the ground and breathed life into it to create humanity. God breathed something into an existence there which wasn't perfect. It was us. And it couldn't be perfect because it wasn't God. And... I know some kids, some students will argue sometimes, well, but we were perfect before Eve ate the, Eve ate the apple. Maybe so, but I, I kind of think, well, if we were perfect, then how could there have been a temptation there even to eat of the tree? Because God said it was good. He didn't say, and he saw and said it was perfect. He said it was good. And I think that because Scripture is also God-breathed, it means that it too is not God. It is not perfect it passes through, it's God-breathed, God-inspired, definitely what Paul says does not come from human origin, but it does pass through Paul, a human, an intermediary. And in the beginning, that intermediary was dirt. And God breathed into it, and the result is us. We were created. And in the case of the Bible, God breathed his truth into hearts and minds of people like Paul, and the result is the Bible, the Scripture. But just like that dirt, the people who wrote the Bible were not perfect. Paul, Paul even says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. Now if Paul believed the Bible was perfect, I feel like he would have said, 
we fully know because we have scripture, because this is it. But he didn't because he knew that even with scripture as his source of knowledge, that the knowledge was imperfect because it was God breathed and not God himself. And it's like the people who wrote it were not perfect. And it's okay because just like our parents, we can still learn important truth from the imperfect people that wrote it. And this is kind of where the faith comes in. It kind of forces us to rely on, uh, it re forces us to rely on and put our trust in God. And without the need for faith, is there really a need for God? I mean, at least on this side of eternity. And when Paul spoke of seeing through a mirror dimly, it was a statement of faith that even though his knowledge was only in part and wasn't perfect, it was enough. It was enough for his salvation and enough to see him through until Christ's return. And when we claim the inerrancy, the need for this kind of humble faith disappears and is a little bit more replaced with the arrogance that claims that the certainty that even the writers of the Bible themselves weren't willing to say. It means when we claim certainty about the Bible, we reject the need for faith. When we claim certainty, we claim that creation is perfect rather than the creator is perfect. When we claim certainty, we kind of create the same need for certainty and control that drove Adam and Eve to pick that fruit and to attempt to be like a perfect God. And you may have certainty and no need for faith in the Bible, but I think the Apostle Paul sure did need his faith. And the one thing I am certain about is that so do I. And all God's people said, Amen. We recite the words of the Apostles' Creed together. Please stand if you are able. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated and we receive the offering at this time. Dear God, we lift, we lift the Birkeland family up in prayer today at the death of Tim's mom. We also pray for Ron Buckhouse, Shirley Bunker, Kathy Cavanaugh, the Dow family, Wayne Eckhoff, the Hobies, Dorothy Johnson, Lila Masters, Herb Meyer, Bob and Shirley Moe, Boyd Nelson, Dorothy Norbeck, Wayne so Wade Soley, Phil Sunberg, Irv Tokenen, Larry Wilson, Kathy Bickle, Brian Bauer, Bill Cole, Donna Gill, Hudson Graham, Jessica Hoff, 
Danny Imdicke, Paige Johnson, Channing Katz, Pat and Karen Kilby, Michael Lind, Ben Miller, George Nagel, Kathy Peterson, Carol Smith, Jeff Smith, Gail Sonnenberg, Carol Teague, and Gib Wegscheid. And all those in our hearts that are heavy for us today, we lift up in prayer also. And we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.